I, I appreciate that uh, many people joined the session and are interested in this. And uh, I'm obviously very excited and passionate about this title and the content. I would like to, to bring in a few quotes. I will make some product placement. And I also would like to take the liberty to maybe make it a little bit fun. And I want to start with this quote, which says all models are wrong and some are useful because I understand that in strategy work, there might not be that one go-to model. And even if there was, it might be wrong, but maybe there are things that are very useful. So this is what this is all about. I want strategy and the content overall to be useful to you. And I have one, one observation that I made during this work as I researched around strategy and, and systemic design, that most of these tools, they are apparently agnostic. And I think that is a good thing. They are like neutral or objective. But then again, as you see in my comments here, if organizations were to use these TL tools, would they become more strategic? I think so, maybe. You know, depends what they use them for. They still have to then implement strategy. And I guess the presentation will show that doesn't always go well. But the deeper purpose is, would companies with these strategies become more sustainable? I don't think they would. That's only if they change their mindset and that's what they would really want. So have a look at these tools as they are agnostic. Um, and I guess, and I hope that a lot of what I say is not agnostic. I'm clearly giving a, a direction where I believe strategy should go. So this is an invitation. I would like, well, you are here for the talk and I would like to invite you to my garage, to my workshop, if you want, make a few reflections, um, roll up your sleeves as you see what is part of my daily work. And I really like to share the existing tools that I've come across in my research and how they connect to systemic design. And the invitation goes to you to do, to do similar work and follow similar patterns. So I think you as well, as you come across tools, you, you research them, you evaluate them, and you keep integrating them into your overall framework, into your methodology, and into what I like to call your playbook or your tool set. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. And I'm going to do that with you. I might have chosen the right tools. I might have chosen the wrong tools. All I can say is this is practice. And practice is the most important thing here. And uh, I'm not even claiming that most of these tools are systemic. Some are not. And I do that with the other mission, which is what's driving me really is I, I feel, I sense, that strategy should be a co-creative thing. It should be inclusive to many people. It should actually be easy to understand so that it's easy to communicate. And I really want more people to work in that. And it should be iterative and a continuous thing. As overall, it relates to the future fitness of us, of civilization and the planet. So that's what it's really all about. Um, and it needs to allow for space for emerging ideas. So with that in mind, let's start, let's roll up our sleeves and I show you a little bit around. I would like to play with the words of why organizations, why strategy, why the crisis, what are principles that might help us to see with systemic design as our glasses on so we can really see how, how does that look into strategic work? We want to get practical with these tools. And then I show you a few tools that I found on the way that, I've, that I really think are very interesting and they can actually be used and practiced. There, there, is, there is one or the other quote in here. And I, I gather that you will have seen these quotes so many times and during the conference, but I sort of have to prove with this presentation today, why these quotes, they really do matter and they're pretty much to the point. Um, and with that, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. 
Um, I'm an independent consultant. I call that work to be brave because I believe we need to be brave in, in our current times. I am a member of the board of directors at the Flourishing CoLab. I'm as well part of the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. And I invite you to join the session. I think it's in four or five hours from now where we have a, an, an extra river around the Flourishing Enterprise. So please join that one as it begins with a conversation between John Ehrenfeld and Peter Jones. Um, I'm a course lead at the School of the Possible and you will find me every once in a while at the speaker series of the Flourishing Collab, as well as at the Systems Innovation Hub in Portugal and also with the Organizations Hub. So watch that space, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you're interested in these topics, I like to share and there's always something interesting to find. Now, my background is in business. I studied business economics and linguistics. And I guess that tells a lot. And from my experience, you can see I've worked in very traditional and very industrial organizations, as well as in startup situations for a long time. And I took that knowledge as I've been for 15 years, I've been a consultant for management. And I take these learnings into stories, if you want. And I like to teach and take these stories and practices into university and into speeches so that I can share what these learnings were. Let's dive into this. So why this title? Um, let's start with organizations then. Why organizations? Well, organizations are living systems in a, in a, in a complex world. Organizations are built out of individuals, persons, families, communities, and they're embedded in much bigger systems, in social systems, in the natural systems. And organizations actually do cause harm. So they're not innocent. According to the old paradigm, organizations work, you know, think of Charlie Chaplin working in the factory um, in a mechanical mindset, and they follow these patterns of a more hierarchical governance. They are after profit maximization, and they basically play with quality and quantity to derive competitive advantages. That's what they do. They follow norms, they follow laws, and while they do that, the planet is not looking any better. So organizations are driver of an environmental crisis, though they could really have a big impact on the future of our planet and the flourishing of planet and people, if only they would accept that mandate. Could it be that organizations, they don't see the whole picture? Are they stuck in the old paradigm? Um, do they need to understand this interconnectedness of challenges and the changing conditions? Could they be more proactive and adaptive if only they wanted? So as living systems, they should actually be able to contribute in a positive way. And here goes the hypothesis. Could they not evolve their purpose and their culture and their practice so that they become more adaptive and transformative, which should be good for them but that should also be good for us. Hence the picture to the right with the, with the iceberg. So that's kind of a theory of change. And now I quickly wanted to look into what I found on Wikipedia around strategy. And I highlighted these words, which I found very typical. It's about leaders, but hey, already in the second sentence, it says strategy is important because the resource is available. They are limited, interesting. There are patterns of activity. Okay, let's see a few more. We deliver, they deliver value as part of, of a unique value proposition, formulating, developing doctrines that they follow faithfully, all right? One of the, the very interesting uh, thinkers, which I can recommend you, you read, is, is Henry Mintzberg. And, and he lays it out very well. And many of the strategy professors and us, the students, we, we, we 
we structure strategy around that and we say, oh, it's a plan. It's a directed course of action. It's a pattern. The, the emergence is part of that. Okay, great. It's a position. It's factors outside of the family uh, of the firm, so not only inside. And we it's like a game, it's a ploy. It's it's to outwit competitors. But then again, strategy is also a perspective based on a theory of the business and a natural extension of the mindset. Now, as odd as it seems to go to Wikipedia, I found that super interesting because all of these descriptions, they will, in one way, they will hit us. In another way, they will be useful as we go figure out what to do about strategy. Now, what really drove me into this topic as a, as a business person, right? And as a, as, a, as a student of business and as a teacher of business, I ask myself, okay, so why do business strategies actually fail? Why can we not see a visual representation of a strategy? Like lately, the last couple of years working very much in business design and being in the design area and service design, I wonder where is that one strategy canvas that might be useful? There are a few, but then again, um, there are not many and are they any good? I don't know. If I think about strategy as described before and how it's being lived out there in organizations, we very much hear about that strategy is actually done in an offsite meeting in the middle of the forest where a few senior execs sit, sit together and they come up with a strategy. And then that one is like every one or two years. So I think that is the paradigm we are looking at. That's, that's what we can see. And they come up with, with objectives which are around competition and numbers and i wonder is that actually really a strategy and how do they fail about it because i won't bore you with the research but i think the number is like 70 percent where these strategies do not come to fruition when strategy is done it still needs to be implemented which is where many of the problems lie and yeah, strategy in principle is looking into the next one or two years. So that's my setting for strategy. And I look at that and I make a much bolder comment, which says, oh, though we saw in Wikipedia that's about the finite resources, where did the planet actually show up in what I just saw and what these thinkers are telling us? Why are they not talking about the planet? If we speak of strategy, then, and we ask companies, they might claim, oh, hold on, we got a strategy for that. It's called our sustainability strategy, or maybe their CSR strategy or what have you. So they might think we are good. We've done our job, fulfilling the, the regulations. And from there, I then delve into further considerations where I say, hmm, this is strange. Let's have a closer look. Could strategy deserve another pair of eyes, more people being involved? And what could we do about it? Because we have all these challenges we have to tackle with. Now I've taken this view to bombard us with the poly crisis, it's on purpose, right? Basically, we, we need to make a, a challenge map to understand how did enterprises um, contribute to the poly crisis? What are they moving? What are they doing? How do they relate to climate change? And I think we all get that. We understand that. That is the real challenge. And that's not part of strategy, or is it? And as we look further, we would then say, well, if Peter Zengi from the fifth discipline is right, then today's problems, they come from yesterday's solutions. So that is just to say that strategy brought us here where we are today and we need to change our mindset so we need to work together we need to co-create we need to collaborate and we need to change our consciousness of all of this going on but where is the strategy to go do that let's dive deeper 95 percent of these issues at work within organizations they are actually called to be systemic yeah. so we won't solve these in an easy way and transformations fail 
just like strategies fail. So we are really in trouble here. And what I like to look much deeper into and where my research is going lately are these people challenges. It's us. So what can we contribute? What can we do? Because us as employees or being part of organizations, we feel the pressure. We have to deliver more at higher quality with less resources as well. So how, where is the magic to become better than the sum of all these employees? We have many stakeholders' expectations to fulfill, and we're running up and down in, in business. What I found very inspiring was from Peter Hawkins, who then said in, in his reflections, and he's a professor for, for leadership, and he said, the real challenges in organizations, as it relates to people, obviously, they are not in the parts, but they are in the connections. And that sounds very systemic. So we should look into connections. That is a first hint where to go with our strategy work. So we require additional approaches to address these complexities yeah, and we should the relations between the parts. Which takes us to systemic design as our go-to place. And let me go through this very fast. This is from a paper of Peter Jones. So systemic design offers us these principles and that's why you're here at this conference to, to find more of them. And obviously I need to show that slide quickly to demonstrate that we, we are managing boundaries within organizations and the work we describe it, it starts at the bottom in the layer of, of design 1.0 and it goes right into the layer of design 3.0 where the social purpose sits for organizations and somehow it goes a little bit beyond, though we don't know how to touch it. And I guess it's better that the business organizations don't even touch that part for all the harm they might have caused. Now, this is important because how do we manage that? What are our capabilities of entering that space? And we must realize that every organization has its own context. And that diagram shows that complexity is just rising the further up we go. So what would help us to think strategy differently? Based on these principles that I just saw, I've put a few words together to, to have principles for sense making, because I'm saying, well, putting all of this together, strategy should be holistic, should be embedded and life centric, uh, should be coherent as well, relational, adaptive, emergent, and tensions that this will all create. Well, that's for sure. But then again, the tensions that we might see, they might actually be good. They might tell us something. So let's have a look at these tensions as well. And to the right, if systemic design is our sweet spot, then strategy making should focus on co-creation and we need to take care of facilitation of such projects. We need to build in the zooming in and zooming out. And we might find leverage points as we go and we walk through that problem space. And we need a lot of patience and we need to adapt because the higher we go on that diagram I showed you before, the, le the less likely it is we find solutions quickly and there might not be a fix. So we need to experiment. But then again, have organizations not told us to use principles like, or methodologies like the lean startup or being agile. So actually they might know how to do it from a method point of view. So here we go. I come out of my garage and I say, what if strategy would be just simple? And simple in our case would mean it should be very highly visual. And if it was visual, then we could all go roll up our sleeves again and be co-creative. And strategy could be inclusive to more than just the happy few and senior leadership. And if it was, then strategy would also become motivational because mot motivational is great, we could engage Otherwise, we just receive strategy at the other end, and we might not even understand it. We also understood it's a continuous iterative exercise. There are emerging things. 
we should plan for that. And very clearly, there's a context boundary and it's time-based. That might sound abstract, but let's go and make it less abstract. So one principle I took here is where I say, it's not me saying it, I'm just presenting it and say any attempt to create, deliver and capture value needs to be life centric. That sounds good. That sounds to be building on the right principles. This is research from, from Nancy Boken, which I have contributed to as a very interesting paper on regenerative business models. And you can already see in my quote to the left that a lot of my thinking as a business person is around this idea of creating, delivering, and capturing value. That is even the definition of a business model per se. If the life centricity is part of these principles, then a holistic view on us walking the way from the person, the individual, until the planet on the outer edge, that seems to make sense. That's holistic, that's embedded, and the relations in between these, we've just been told, if we believe that finding from Peter Hawkins, that's actually what really matters. And that's what we're not good at. And we should look into that and start working on it. So on the, on the low scale, this is the bubble. This is the circle that I offer. And I say, it's within this context that that organization as our object finds itself and needs to manage any other situation coming out of this. So let's put this at the base and let's start working with the very first circle, if you wish. You've already seen my, my uh, liking of business modeling, which, which hasn't gone away. You realize on the left side, that's what we call the backstage. That's where the activities, the resources build the business as such it explains everything that's being done and on the right side if we walk from the value proposition to the stakeholders the customers the needs that we fulfill via various channels and the relationship that's what we call the front stage so that's what's going on in a business and at the bottom we what we call the revenue model is what I would like to call the impact model. That's really the result of a business. So I'm overlaying this idea into the holistic embedded view of the planet and the person, because the planet is the life enabling system that, that sits here. So to the left, you see the idea of a more advanced business model view, which contains the not only the economy, but also society and the environment. So we need to start thinking in different spheres. We need to understand the relationships between these spheres as well. So we need to think more in complexity terms to really grasp this. And then I came across, um, a few strategy models where I said, okay, I always liked Roger Martin. He, he makes this so understandable. Obviously he's a design thinker. That's sort of what IDEO does if, if we wanted to know. And I like the definition, which is much closer to, to what I learned in business at the time, which says strategy is a set of choices to create superior value for customers. And I, I can agree with that for now, given all these other constraints. So that's a nice visual representation. And I like that strategy canvas here to the left, the ladder, as, as he walks and explains. Then I've looked into a framework of McKinsey, which is called the 7S, um, which they made it work, starting with, with the letter S at the beginning. That one looked interesting as well, because I said, we, we need to like dissect and operate strategy. So what are these parts? How can we make sense? Is that maybe where these relationships could also be tackled? And I went further and I found this one, which is very, very interesting as well. And even 
on the website of Strategizer, the company from, from Mr. Osterwalder, the, the person who, who became famous, and we are grateful that, that he gave us the business model canvas. Mr. Galbright has a star model where, very similar to the McKinsey one, where he manages these diverse parts and he tries to, to like have a cockpit here to drive these, these different parts into one thing. And that can be overlaid, and it sort of speaks that language of front stage, backstage, revenue model, but we are not there yet. I then came across uh, my, my German fellows from Dark Horse, and which, which is a very interesting consulting cooperative, and they came up with a strategy hexagon. So I looked into that and I said, oh, that's very cool, that's interesting. That's very visual. So how are they doing this? How, how are they able to put these diverse parts into one circle? Because that's what I wanted to see. And they created a model which is slightly different to the one you are looking at. And they're basically capable of answering these questions of who are we as an organization and where are we going? How do we organize? And these, these parts made a lot of sense to me. So I started playing with these puzzle pieces and broke it apart, it put it back together and then said, well, it would only be logical if we would put in a visual model of a strategy, which is to the right, the model that, that I'm trying to present is the one that I'm currently grappling with. So we start with purpose, purpose is everywhere. Um, and we also need to give more thinking around what do we mean with purpose? Is that really a North Star or is that again, just marketing, blah, blah. So how do we figure that out? Certainly we should build on the identity of a company that exists. It's what companies grapple with, it's their history and it's also what they advertise and they market. So it's not even true. It's not really authentic, but there it is. It's a puzzle piece in its own identity. There is the business model to the right where I say, okay, that is more the front stage. This is more about playing to win and how to win. And the most important element beyond purpose to me is that puzzle piece of a theory of change. That's the real impact that organizations have in the real world. So let me move one slide further as I lay this out and you can see that. With this type of view, I can start playing. I can make, for example, I can grasp an understanding of the spheres of influence of an organization with all the relationships around it, which I believe I have put them here. Sorry to jump. So this kind of view helps me to get organized about all these possible relationships that an organization might have. And I've just put a few here. This is not complete and we could have different views on that, but just, I just felt I need to put it out here and ask these relevant questions, which are somewhere in a business model under relationships, which I think is undervalued. How are we in touch with all these actors? And what's our relation to all these people out there and entities? And clearly the one that I missed here is the planet in and by itself. Planet as one of the actors need to be included in that model. So if I play with this type of a model, um, I can start aligning, I can think of my circle to the right, speaking around elements of corporate development because with my business model, I can walk in that direction. The, the bottom part is about my own performance, my competences, my capabilities, and maybe the lack thereof. So that's where I want to bring in partners. And I want to call that a partner ecosystem as I go design that. And on the left side is the big intangible, I think, which is everything we want, want to put under culture. And what is that? and then the structure of the company as well. So maybe this is something that could be called organization design. I go quickly back so that we can look at it again. And then maybe we could ask these type of questions 
to understand how such a strategy model could look like. And from here, relationships, I'm actually able, if I look at this type of a model, I can ask these questions that I surface at the very beginning around, what are these challenges actually with organizations? And I've collected a few and they kind of support my theory of why this strategy circle is currently looking the way it does. It might not be me see after all, but I found it very useful to start working with a model like that and evolving it. Items in here can be made tangible. It can be made manageable. This is the sort of tool that I've been looking for and I'm appreciating using it. Um, you could use it as a canvas as it stands. You can put uh, objectives inside if you want. But as you're visiting me today in my garage, and, and Cheryl did write it nicely into the description of this session, there should be tools all around and within this type of framework that are useful to us. So maybe we revisit these slides later, but I go ahead. I want to start talking about these individual parts. So let's start about the middle part, another, another circle that I've put in the middle, which is the purpose one. So how could we go about purpose? You, you might know Simon Sinek's way of looking into the purpose, you might, which is called the golden circle. Um, you might know the tool, the five whys, so that you ask five times why. I just believe it's tremendously important to have the purpose in front of the organization, in front, like I said, it's your North Star. Because the observation actually is, we are not asking and we are not interesting as human beings too much in the why. We are may, way more attracted by the what. And that's strange, but that's what we intuitively do. But if we would really ask the five times why, um, we, we get to more clarity, we have more motivation. How do we get there? Well, we, we need to ask why. There's no other way around it. There might be tools for doing that. And I will show you the golden circle on the next slide. But also, scientists have figured out that if we start with the real why, we become less ego-centric. We start looking outwards. We start looking into how we serve the world. We figure out what our real calling is. And I like to have put here the word, we become service-centered. That should appeal to organizations, right? That's what they are about. If we ask them today, they're all gonna tell us how human-centered and service-oriented they are. Well, if only they were, because if they would really figure out their deeper purpose, it actually helps them. So that's cool. I call that systemic in a way. And our culture, yeah, is also hindering us because we look into the ego most of the time, at least in the Northern hemisphere, that's what we do. So how do we go about it? The golden circle. And this is like thinking, and that's one trick that I use in, in the garage, it makes so much sense for me. I take thinkers like Simon Sinek, and uh, Michelle Holiday, and I merge that together and I say, okay, so how could we mix tools to come to more systemic point of views? So how can I make the golden circle even more iterative and more holistic as it already might be? Well, you can ask more questions. So let's ask a few questions that you figured that why do we show up? is that principal question that we can just ask every day. What brings us together? What are we trying to do is then the what that becomes our mission. And how are we doing that? That's sort of our strategy. How are we implementing this? What has to be true? But we can go beyond. We can ask for the numbers. We can ask for the how much and when and what is too much or too little. So that's interesting questions to ask here and provoke ourselves in a good team based workshop and figure answers to these questions out what objectives shall we actually measure 
And we already do that in a first purpose exercise. I like that. And that's why I've put the, the theory of change as an important element of, of strategy. Going back to the business model, you saw that one before. And there, there is actually an existing business model, which already has a few years. It's science-based. It's, it's been delivered and developed by Anthony Upward and Peter Jones. And that is the best business model that I know of currently. I've seen a lot of hype around regenerative business models. And to, in my view, they haven't been able to crack what is really needed. It's this embedded approach, connecting environment, society, economy, and asking the best questions that one can ask. Because this sort of flourishing canvas view is inclusive to all the actors and all the stakeholders of the enterprise, you also involve them as you develop the canvas and by itself. It's inclusive to the social and environmental questions that we need to ask. And without going deeper in here, this is also a perfect tool to tell the story of the business, how these elements come together and how to end up with a coherent business model or not. As mentioned before, the theory of change is important in a strategy. It turns out it's very much appreciated within social enterprise. And I really wonder why is it not used in business? Is this not the rationale that everybody should master? Is this not the challenge map that we should do in particular problems? I believe it is. And that's why it really, it really matters. And I end up with the, the time horizon, three horizons as another tool because strategy is based on time horizons and not just context. Um, I'm checking the time and I need to rush a bit and I'll see how I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm offering two pathways through that strategy view, and there are many. And I will show you these in, in snapshots. This is a deeper dive, which I have to rush through now, but I, I think the slides can, can do the job. So let us walk from purpose, identity, our capabilities, all the way through the business model and the theory of change. And that's just a visual way of going through this. So I'm suggesting we would use these sort of tools and we practice and go through all of that. Um, as we make sure we are embedded, we start, we collect all the stakeholders, we make the mind map of the iceberg to figure out where we really are, where our mindset is. We relate that. And then in the bigger model, imagine a pathway to walk into the future. So we do a sort of strategic foresight, and this is open and agnostic. What I'm obviously suggesting here is, let's do a backcasting exercise, but this is all interchangeable with other tools. This is completely open. And as you go and you do the backcasting exercise, you fill out your business model canvas, hopefully the flourishing one. I, I hope I, I was able to sell it well for, it, for what it does. We elaborate the theory of change and we elaborate that for three time horizons. We do it for today anyways, because that's part of the backcasting exercise, but we also do it for maybe one or two years into the future five years into the future, 10 years into the future. If we did that, and that's what I have to jump now, we would come up with a view that looks more or less like this. Because for each distinct time frame, we have figured out where we stand. We know our time set, we know our mindset. And we know what needs to change and be influenced. We know our theory of change. And we have three different types of business models as we 
look into the future. Um, to me, that's a powerful exercise and you can choose the tools as you may to reach at that point. And these are just simplistic views, how to go about this sort of a tool and the pathways um, and alignment that is required as you go play with it. If I walk to the left, I need to make the intangible parts tangible, the culture and the structure, because now we start talking of concepts like governance structures, ownership, um, leadership are the words that come to mind on this side, and we need to figure out what to do with them as we go. So future fitness is then way more than just looking into the survival of the company, because now we're looking into the coherence of an organization, the various structures in organizing that might be possible. I might drop here the work on reinventing organizations, for example, or the various shapes that an organizational diagram might take these are all playful elements that, that should be used in this type of, of exercise, because this is all about the sense making, the decision making, and ultimately taking action. And that's what we want to do as a team. So this is very team focused. And we're looking into areas like the autonomy, the competence, and the relatedness of an organizational culture. Now, I haven't laid out this portion with the according tools. That's still work in progress. And a lot of this will actually happen with undertaking challenge mapping to figure out what the right connections are. And with the challenge mapping, you figure out the leverage points you want to address. Every organization is different. The diversity is important, but it's also important that they become more authentic than they already are. And every organization must find their own structure, how to go about it. Um, there is no prescription here to be made. All I can ask here in this area of, of the drawing is how would an organization thrive in self-organized teams and how would they hire for values if that's what they want? That's what we hear that that would make sense. <coughs> Sorry. One element that I like a lot is how do we create safe and inclusive spaces? And with that, we create these human-centric experiences and environments. That's very important. This drawing needs to sit a little bit more to the left so that we get the, the point here. I like a, a saying of, of a professor from, from Lisbon who, while he speaks too much about the role of the leader here, I really like the idea of this is about building these relationships in an organization, building these people, building on the values and having a purpose so that then the team can actually deal with the challenges and not necessarily that leader. We don't need that hero. That is the message here. So overall and finishing up quickly, this is about the identity and story of a company evolving that's what really needs to evolve the mindset as the organization becomes more authentic and true to itself. And purpose is shaped as that strategy work is being done. And the only way I really want to talk about competition in a strategy session is with the words of Peter Zengi, who says, the only sustainable competitive advantage is an organization's ability to learn faster than the competition. And I would argue they can learn together with their partner ecosystem. If you liked this session, um, I very much like you to send you over to the Flourishing CoLab for speaker series, to the talk later on as a four hour session with the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Come see us as well as at the Systems Innovation Hub for Portugal and for organizations. And if you liked my garish work and you would like to join me in exercising these type of tools, I'm gonna put this sort of exercising and practice sessions up at the School of the Possible. So just follow me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to see you joining these sort of courses.
over you to you, Thomas. Maybe I should end the screen sharing so I can actually see. And yeah, thank, thank you, Bon. Uh, yeah, fantastic talk. And then you open up your toolbox and show all the tools you have and then how to use the different thing in a different uh, way. There are a bit of a comments and, and questions from that chat box, but if anyone, we have about, I don't know, five to six minutes. So if anyone want to just, you know, or, or, or speak up, uh, then uh, that's completely fine. So uh, any comments, any question to Bon? There are some questions about five whys. Probably you mentioned about iceberg models and five whys, and then yeah, whether five whys can can be um, yeah, uh, yeah. I find that five whys can miss essential aspect of the root cause. I would add when to locate potential systemic origin that set up problems in the present. So for those who use five whys approach, does it get at structural causalities in the past? Um, any any thoughts, Bon? You want to share about five whys? Yeah, I I was actually hoping people. I really appreciate this question on the five whys. I would hope that people they try it out. Um, how the the five whys is being facilitated within their team, and they see what happens. And I would hope that the other tool, the golden circle, where you ask different type of questions starting with the why would actually make sense and might be the preferable one and then once you answered all these questions especially the ones about you know when and how much and you might want to reiterate back to the why and see whether that did actually resolve the the challenges that a a simple five why exercise might have caused i still believe if it's well facilitated it makes good sense but I appreciate the comments and I will read them more deeply. Good. I mean, whatever tool, tool we use, we have a linear mindset that it can be used very linear way. And then, so there's a paper on problems with five Ys. So that explain what can go wrong with, with five Ys. There's another question, which would you consider process as folded into structure in your model, uh, Kins, Kinsey? Um, because the process is a folded uh, into structure in your model. Um, is, is Kinsey still here? I mean, can you elaborate what that question means? Yeah, um, I'll try. They're replacing my roof, so it's kind of loud here right now. Uh, I can say. Hi, I am um, looking at your model. Um, it was interesting to see how you broke it up and juxtaposed them. I appreciated that. And one of the uh, sections was structure. And so I wondered if part of that structure in an organizational frame would include process um, so that it incorporates the, uh, well, the structure, but also what is overlaid that and what happens within it and what yeah. it enables and prohibits. Yes, yes, Kinsey. So the, the processes, they, they fit within that uh, structure box. Um, it's, it's all there. And maybe the area of, of leadership and governance also overlaps into that structure puzzle piece, if you want. Good. Thank you. So there is another question from Al Walker about feels like it's moving toward giga mapping for strategy development, which could be fun. So do you kind of... Uh, use some kind of giga mapping to map certain things and finding relationships in your approach? Bon? Yes, yes, definitely. That that makes a lot of good sense. Um, and I think it always depends on who's looking at that. The, the, the tool that I've presented here, I mean, none of these tools tools are mine, if you want. I'm just building on the wisdom of others here. Their purpose was to be really simple and co-creative because that sits at the base. We want to work together. Imagine that tool being used. Now, the bigger map obviously could hang on a huge brown paper in a session, makes also good sense and serves us. Good. Um... Uh, just one last one. How can uh, a question from Aswini? Uh, how can an organization design 
or change its culture to make sure strategy is being executed as many as many suffer from complacency. Any thoughts from your experience, Bob? Yeah. Can Can I ask you to repeat it, please? Yeah. How can an organization change its culture to make sure the strategy is being executed uh, uh, as many suffer from complacency? Um, my take on that is to make it inclusive and to have strategy work represented in every team across the organization. I want to see involvement and people at the table doing that work. Now, that will highly depend on the size of a company, but I do see a structure where input from all people is represented. And the, the leadership is basically giving that central function away into the, the parts of that organism of, of our living organization so that people and their viewpoints, they can participate and they're being heard. And that would change completely the, the dynamics. Thank you. Thank you, Bond, for your lots of uh, interesting tools, but also insight. I mean, Cheryl um, mentioned something in the chat saying about joining. Um, Cheryl, can you say about that if you're still around? Oh, it's just stepping out. No, I'm just inviting everyone. Thank you, Bernard, for such a fantastic view into your garage. It truly was. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll have a recording, which I think will be very useful for people as well who are approaching strategy and organizations. I just um, wanted to say if uh, people feel like a quick dip into a metaphor map, into a map, not a metaphor map, but a very cool, almost graffiti map, uh, the next session um, is uh, is on the world under our feet. And it's just a quick 30 minute uh, look at a very interesting map. We're trying to integrate the concept of mapping into uh, into sessions this year so that they don't get forgotten being so central to systemic design. So good. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for staying on. And thank you, uh, Bon. Shall we give a round of applause to Bon for fantastic talks and uh, his thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. You. Yeah, we'll see you around in the another session then. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.